Our scripture reading this morning is from Nehemiah, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard those words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayers of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was cupbearer to the king. Thank you, Beiju. Good morning, church. So today is the last Sunday of August, the last Sunday of the summer officially, and the last Sunday before our kids go to school, so praise the Lord for that. And today is the last Sunday on our summer series, The the, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. And I think there's a sermon somewhere there, the last, right? But today is not that sermon. Uh, just a brief announcement. Uh, today at 4, at 5.30, if you are in, interested or intrigued or want to know more about Perspectives, we as a church are hosting uh, Perspective with 4C. Uh, we have about 12 people have registered. We hope that more people will register. But today is a free class and also next week. So if you want to come out and test, test the water without paying anything, today is the day. Um, so hopefully to see you there. So today I'm very excited uh, to preach on Nehemiah. Um, I preached several years ago on Nehemiah, the entire book, so I'm going to try to compress uh, based upon the time that we have today. Also, please continue to pray for our team of Ukraine. Uh, there are certain things that are happening within the team that, you know, spiritual warfare is coming, especially when we're about to travel. So keep us in prayer. Uh, keep us in prayer. Also pray for our partners in Romania and Ukraine as we're about to uh, go there. So before we get started, there's a couple of things I want to just set us in the same uh, page. Number one, I want to kind of begin to think about what is the time period where Nehemiah writes this book? What's going on historically? So here we have an image of the extent of the Persian Empire around 539 BC. Now what was interesting about uh, the empire is that literally took control of most of the civilizations and most of the villages and the people that we know during that particular time. Now, Cyrus the Great defeated the Babylonians and absorbed the lands of Israel and Judah into their empire. The next year, Cyrus allowed the people of Judah to begin to rebuild and to go home and to create and to rebuild the temple of the Lord. And this took through several waves. So if you're interested to know more about this, I would highly recommend you read the book of Ezra, Esther, and uh, Nehemiah to get more ideas or more information on it. Now, Nehemiah is particularly called by God to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Now, when we get to the book, and once we start flipping the pages through, who is Nehemiah and what is that he's called to do? Now, Nehemiah is very far from Jerusalem. 
It is estimated it's about 500 kilometers or three months worth of journey to get to Jerusalem. He served as the king of Persia. What is important to know that at this time of his call, he was not a spiritual leader or a prophet. He was just a servant. He was a follower of God. However, in his position as a cupbearer, as we will see later on, he had not only a position of influence, but also of power within the king of Persia. At the middle of the book, we see how God enables Nehemiah to restore the people in exile and rebuild the wall. And you kind of see the parameter there of what the wall is going to be built. At the end of the book, we see that not only Nehemiah becomes the governor of Jerusalem and supervises successfully the restoration of the wall, but he's also rebuilt the people in exile. And this is what God was doing during that period of time. So again, if you want to dive in a little bit more about Nehemiah and the book of Nehemiah, there's a couple lessons you will probably get out of it. Number one, the power of prayer through Nehemiah. His leadership, overcoming enemies, adversity, opposition within his group and outside the group. Restoring the hearts, being obedient, being faithful, having faith and a man of integrity are some of the lessons that you can get out of reading the book of Nehemiah. So today, we're just going to sit and look and examine just one chapter of the book of Nehemiah. So we get to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 1, and we get a background. What's happening? Now, when we read the verses 2 and 3, we think that's the beginning of what God is doing in Nehemiah's life. However, if you have been in this position like Nehemiah before, you know that God talks and operates in a very interesting way. So Nehemiah asks the people that are coming back from Judah and asks his brother, says, what is the condition of the people living in exile? What is the condition of the people living in Jerusalem? And the response breaks his heart. The words that are being used here is that the people are in great shame. They're defeated. They're living in destruction. They're living in shame. This is the people of our God. The God that opened and liberated from Jerusalem and, or Egypt and moved them into the promised land. These people are completely destroyed. The words that is being used is they are in great trouble and shame. But also the wall is broken down and the gates are destroyed by fire. That is the scene that we open up in Nehemiah. But at what moment did God begin to speak to Nehemiah? We don't know exactly what age he's at. Let's say he's 30 or 28 around there. But I'm assuming that throughout his uh, upbringing, God began to steer the passion, began to think about those people that were in exile back in Jerusalem. And when we begin to read these three verses, two verses that we have here, I want you to think about certain things. I want you to think about what happens to us when we engage in what God is calling us to do, whether as a ministry, as a leader, as a church. What are the things that we should learn from Nehemiah? Just these two verses. Number one is that he asks a simple question. What is the status of the people in Jerusalem? That's it. Now, many of us, like myself, that stand up front, I usually ask, how are you? And that leads to a series of things, right? Some of those I'm not prepared to, <laughs> to deal with. Some of those I'm not well equipped to deal with them. But just asking, right, how are you? Where have you been? That asking means that there was something stirring in his heart that got placed there. We don't know for how long, but he acted on it. He asked. I have a feeling that God was stirring his heart for a long time. As he was reading the Bible, as he was praying, as he was meditating, he remembered the people that were left behind in Jerusalem. Now, what we begin to see is that the people that were left behind in Jerusalem and not taken prisoners to Persia had great affliction and shame. But who was going to fix that? Who was going to restore Jerusalem? Who was going to restore the people? 
They lacked protection from their enemies, and they had no pride or identity. But why did he ask? And the reason is simple. Because God asked him to do that. So he was responding to a need that God had placed before his heart. The second thing he did is that he heard the discussion. Maybe he interrupted. Maybe he asked follow-up questions. Maybe he dug a little bit deeper to see what were the conditions was. How big was the devastation? How many people were there? I don't know. But we know that he heard the problem. The other thing that I think for all of us as Christians today living in a society that we see lots of, lots of problems is that we need to learn. What are the conditions around us? How are school systems? How are our teachers? How are our neighbors doing spiritually, physically, emotionally? But furthermore, he understood that something needed to be done. But here's when we begin to understand what God steers us to do, and then how humanly we have to respond to that need. That need was too large, too large of a task for one man to achieve. But God began to steer and move the heart of Nehemiah. Last Saturday, a friend of mine is in town. He's a missionary in Ecuador. I know him really well. I know some of his struggles. I know what he's working in. I know the conditions that he's living in. So he's doing, uh, this entire summer he was here, gathering support from his uh, ministry partners. And we went there and just sat in his house. He had breakfast for us. And I'm like, man, that's great, right? I I should bring him breakfast, but he was cooking for us. He cooked uh, lunch for us, right? We were there for six, seven hours just learning and hearing about what's happening, how God is moving in the Amazon. Probably an hour three, hour four, he tells us about how difficult it is to engage with churches and to ask them to be partners in the ministry. He tells me about a particular uh, Sunday that he drives with his children up to Chicago to speak at a large church. The pastor is welcoming. He says, look, I'm so excited to show you our new dining hall. $1.4 million has gone in in renovating that hall. He's like, wow, amazing. So he goes on, he preaches, and he does, he shares the vision, and then the pastor comes at the end. He says, thank you so much for coming. But we can't give you an offering today because we just spent $1.4 million in the dining hall. He goes, there's stories like that all the time as we go into churches. We don't go for the money. We just go there to cast vision and to be obedient to what God is doing. But think about what is God doing in our church. Think about how God is calling us individually in our community groups, in our 3D groups, in our ministries, in our leadership positions. You will hear soon about the initiative that we're starting in the fall about the uh, um, resettlement of the refugees. A family will be moving from somewhere in northern Africa into the United States, and that is at a cost of $5,000 per person. That's a God-sized problem. Amen? Who's going to respond to that need? When we talk to the church and we say, we're going to go to Ukraine. God has called us to go and see what God is doing in that part of the world. We had a God-sized problem. The goal was $3,500 for boxes of food. He said, it would be nice if you raised $9,000. I said, well, let's start with $3,500 and then work away. Right? We'll see. $9,000 came in easily. A God-sized problem. Think about the building that we're trying to acquire, right? The seams that we can't get. There's no building in Silver Spring. That's a God-sized problem. Think about the church planting network that we want to establish and be part of throughout the area. That is a God-sized problem. Think about the luncheons that we're doing for the teachers, right? They're going back to school. Demoralized, cots, overcrowding. Problems with uh, authority, right? That's a God-sized problem. So how is God calling us? Now, when God calls us to any of these God-sized problems, we have to understand what is my role in the middle of that problem and what is God's role in that problem. And that takes some time learning. So what is our response? What should be the response when we begin to see the problems around us, when we begin to feel And we begin to see around us there's so much need and we feel overwhelmed to the point that we freeze because it's just too much. 
found this illustration that I think helps us to understand a little bit. And this is about perspectives. In the problem, we see a magnitude, something so large that we cannot overcome. Whether that is cancer, whether that is problems in our families, whether that's losing our job, whether that's an illness, whether that is whatever you want to put it, we see the problem being too large for ourselves. To the point that we feel there's just a mountain there that we cannot overcome. But the question is always forgotten, where is God in the middle of that problem? Is he outside the problem? Is he near the problem? Where is God in all of this? And this is where Nehemiah begins to understand that anything that God puts in our hearts, not only he's calling us to see that, but he's also equipping us to do so. And that is the second part that I want you to begin to pay attention. We're going to um, go a little bit faster because there's other things we have to do. So when we read the next verses, Nehemiah 1.4 and Nehemiah 1.5, we begin to see the response of Nehemiah. He says, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continue fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So what should be our response when we have a God-sized problem? Number one, verse number four, don't do anything about it. Nehemiah did not run to Jerusalem. Nehemiah did not call a stir committee. He didn't do fundraising. He didn't like post it on social media. He sat down. Now, for someone like myself that like to do things and I'm a problem solver, that is a difficult thing to do. So when do you speed? When do you rest? When do you stop? When do you hold? That's a relationship between you and God. I can't tell you what the correct response is. But I know personally as a pastor that I led a church, there were things that I cannot do because it was not in God's time. I could force it. I could preach on it. I can cast vision and God will say, not the time. But I'm like, I see it. I see it three years before. Church was not ready. He sat down. He didn't do anything about it. Number two, he felt the pain. He wept. He cried for his brothers and sister living in exile. He wept for that remnant. He wept for Jerusalem. Something that maybe you do or maybe you don't. I know I don't do enough. Fast. Right? He began to fast. He began to pray. Regularly, intentionally. Now here on just chapter 1, we just get a glimpse that it was immediate, right? This response. He sat down, he wept, he cried, and he fasted, and he went up and went about his business. No, he did that for four months before God responded or opened the opportunity for him to speak. Now, for us living in America, that we live in a microwave society, right, fast food, everything needs to be on our time, needs to be now. No, God wants to shape you. God wants to mold you. God wants to teach you certain things. In the waiting, in that response, God is molding you, and it's difficult. Now, as we read verse 5, there's also a response there that is important. Nehemiah 1.5 says, And I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. He recognizes the authority of God, the supremacy and the sovereignty of God, but also he acknowledges his limitations as a human. And that is important for us to know. When can we do something and when can we not do? Verse 6 and 7, he also repented. He confessed not only his sins, but the sins of his people. When we get to verse 8, he remembers the promises that are on Scripture. He repeated it back to God. He says, your promises... These are it, and he lists them. 
So what is our correct response when God is asking us to do something? When something that is too great, too large for our human ability. Now, when we get to verse 12, sorry, when we get to verse 11, 10 and 11, we see another aspect that I think is critical for all of us. And here he says, they are your servant and your people. In other words, these are not his people. It's not his problem. That is God to deal with. And sometimes, as leaders, we think it's ours. Right? It's ours. It's my ministry. It's my doing. It's my church. I should. I've been told. But when we begin to realize that God has just called us to be stewards of something that he has called us to do, it's easier. It gives us some freedom. It gives us flexibility to acknowledge that it's not my problem. Right? I always said that. When things happen in church, right? I'm like, God, that is your problem, not my problem. Let me sleep, right? Because usually when something arises, I lose my sleep. And I'm like, God, this is your problem, right? I leave it in your hands. Not that I'm not going to do anything about it, but there's things that in my limitations. And he says, for who you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand, O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Who? The king. The powerful king. Now, what we'll see later on in Nehemiah 2 is that eventually he has to ask the king for something. Now, there's a, something missing from the, the verses that we read and the last sentence in Nehemiah 1.11 is the answer of how God responds. If you read it with me, he says, Now, after doing all this prayer, understanding all the problems, look at this sentence that is, at least in my Bible, is separated from everything else. It says, Now I was what? The cupbearer to the king. In other words, before Nehemiah understood of the problem, before Nehemiah ever prayed... God had already answered his prayer. Let me repeat that again. Before he understood there was a problem, before he acknowledged the problem, before he felt the problem, before he started praying or fasting, God had already put Nehemiah in a position to use him to respond to that need. Now that gives me hope. That gives me hope when I see an issue, when I'm being called to do something, God has already stirred my heart, but it also put me in a position where I can respond to that need. Now, there's a freedom recognizing our limitations. There's a freedom recognizing when we should act and when we should not act. When we should hand over the problem to God or God is equipping us to do something. Now, it doesn't make things easier as a leader, but it allows us to depend on Him more than our needs. When we read Nehemiah, there's a lot of lessons there. I would encourage you to spend some time and just going through the book, taking some lessons that will definitely um, benefit you for our spiritual walk. So as we move on today and we begin to conclude, there's a couple of things that I want you to think about as we move away from the summer series, The Good, The Better, and The Ugly. Number one is that we are the remnant today. We are the leftovers in society that are following Jesus. Now that comes with a huge task and a huge responsibility. We feel isolated in our workplace, where we study, where our kids go to school, maybe in the soccer fields. They are the minority, and that will continue to be true. But how do we respond to that? How do we deal with that sense that there's only a few of us struggling against a society that is turning further and further away from God? Where is God going to be in that realization, in that sense, in that belonging, where you realize you're not it? 
You're the minority. We're equipping, like just Tully just said, we're equipping our children to go out into the world with some biblical truth to stand there against the waves and the currents and the thoughts and the philosophies of this world, right? Yesterday's in the, uh, the seminar on sexuality with our children, providing them identity in Christ to be cemented and founded in Him, rooted deeply in their faith to steer against the storms that they're going to face. But how do we do that as a church? Well, the answers are always in the Bible. I found this verse that gives me hope in Romans eleven five. It says, So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. We are that remnant today. Just like Jerusalem and the Jews were at that particular time, 456 B.C., we're it today. We're sitting right here, looking around our world and seeing the decay and the sin and turning away from God. We're also reminded in the Bible that we are in exile, believe it or not. Hebrews 11.13 says, These all die in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeting them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. This is not our home, realize it or not. Right? Our home is in heaven. Our treasures are in heaven. This is temporary. But we think this is it, right? We're building our wealth, we're building our homes, we're dreaming big dreams here on this earth. But no, God is asking us, what are we doing for his kingdom? We're just passing through. Ephesians 1.7 reminds us that we have been redeemed for a purpose. In him we have redemption. Through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses are according to the riches of his grace. We have been redeemed for a purpose. We have been called. And lastly, 2 Timothy 1, 8 through 9. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, for share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling. Not because of our works, not because of his own purpose, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. So I pray that Nehemiah serves as an example that God will stir in your heart something that is passionate and called by him because you have been redeemed. You are the exile and you are the remnant today. What that is, I have no idea. But as a church, we are being called to stand, to stand firm, to rebuild, to worry about the people. How are they living? What are their conditions? What are the emotional, physical, spiritual conditions? That is why it's important to ask, how are you today? I haven't seen you in a while. Can we go out for lunch or breakfast? or dinner, or tacos, I don't know, right? Whatever that might be. So as we conclude this series, right, there's many things that we have learned throughout this month. But as I ended all my sermons, just be reminded that you and I are a sinner, and we need a Savior. You and I have been saved and need the grace of our Savior today. Let's pray and then move into communion. Dear Father, thank you for the opportunity just to preach, just to be here, Father, to be remembered and to be reminded of our higher calling, of our higher purpose. Thank you for individuals like Nehemiah. Thank you for individuals that are moving, Father, in our communities, holding the gospel, preaching the gospel, Father. Thank you for those missionaries that have said, here I am, take me to the ends of the world. Father, I pray for 
the individuals among our church right now that are facing these God-sized problems. I pray, Father, that you meet them, that you hear them, Father, that you equip them, that they be able to submit to your will, to give them freedom to act accordingly, Father. Thank you again for this opportunity. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's move into communion. This is a time where we can remember the things that God has done in our lives. Let's also remember that he will return for his church. This is a moment to be in gratitude. It's a moment of confession. It's a moment of being just reminded of how good he is. So when you're ready, please take communion.